Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you a gameplay of Pax Transhumanity. Now this is from Matt Eklund, who is the son of Phil Eklund, I believe. And uh, this is a game about the sort of near future where if, you know, what if instead of an apocalypse or instead of a dystopian future, we actually make it through and we have a uh, you know a, a good future where, where science and technology and human progress actually manage to continue to make things better for for humans which generally speaking for the most part is the way things have always gone we've continued to get better and better we've had setbacks but in the the long run of things we've continued to get better and better and, and life has gotten uh, more enjoyable you know, in general, uh, as we've progressed. So, so hopefully that's the way we go in real life, but that's what this game uh, proposes is, you know, what if, what if that is the way things go? What might that look like? So that's what Pax Trace Humanity is all about. We're gonna get to the table here in just a second. I'm gonna show you uh, the beginning of the game, but first I do wanna talk about our sponsor, which is Board Game Co. This is a fantastic website where you can go and buy, sell, and trade games. They've got a great selection over there for you to choose from. They're always looking to buy more games from you, and they're also willing to trade games. They've got a, uh, a, a great trade system set up over there that links right into your Board Game Geek account. They can see what games you have that they want, they can see what games they have that you want, and it'll make a trade happen like that. It even has a value system so you can easily plan out, well, if I trade this game, I can get these games, and that sort of thing. So. Be sure to click the link in the description below. That will let them know that I sent you over there. And that's Board Game Co. where you can buy, sell, and trade your way into a better collection. All right, let's get right down the table and we'll start our gameplay of Pax Transhumanity. All right, so here we go. We have Pax Transhumanity. Now, this is going to be a uh, obviously a uh, video where you're going to get to see a lot of my floor. Uh, this one takes up uh, kind of a strange type of space where I have to use the, the black table here, but I also have to zoom far enough out to where you can see everything and it won't really fit um, properly on the white table, but the white table also has King of Death set up right now. So this is what we're working with. So let's take a look at what we've got going on here. I've already got the game set up. And now this board, by the way, does not come with the game. I bought it separately. When you buy the game, you actually have these and they would be what you would see there so that the board kind of keeps everything more organized gives you specific spots to put all the problems and I just kind of like how it's set up so I did go ahead and, and grab that now let's run through this real quick I brought the patents and human progress down here uh, closer to me but I think I am actually am going to put it up here because it looks like you'll be able to get a good view of it up there. I wasn't sure how this framing was all going to work out, but I think that's what we're going to do. We'll have it up there. I am starting with a patent there on the uh, an assembly patent. And you can see there's one uh, yellow card here already for uh, which yellow is trans biology, green is group dynamics, and blue is uh, computing. But then you can also see the yellow, green, blue, and orange have uh, different uh, different terms out here as well. When they're over here, these are ideas that have been commercialized. So this yellow idea that was commercialized to start the game is regenerative medicine. None of the rest of the stuff on here matters at this point because it's already commercialized. Uh, uh, the one thing that might matter is this was called white heat, or now that it's over there, I believe it's actually called future shock. And what this means is that, so with regenerative medicine, uh, replacing engineering or regenerating human cells, tissues, or organs to restore or establish normal function, well, it has this bioconservatism um, future shock, meaning that, that people, you know, when, with this sort of technology, you, any type of technology, you're generally going to have some pushback. And the pushback for regenerative medicine is, bioconservatism, basically people that might not be so keen on the idea of doing this type of stuff. And I'm not going to go through exactly how that future shock or that white heat over there might 
affect us later on in the game. As those moments come up, I'll kind of explain it as we go. So we have four different spheres in the game. Uh, the first world, developing world, cloud, and space. All right, so let's go through each of these real quickly. And what I'm going to do, so here, let's look at the first world and the developing world first. So initially, let's look at these the problems that come with the first world, all right? So uh, we have disenfranchisement, collective identity, mental health, infirmity, aging, and aging again. So these are six different problems that we can try to claim, try to fix through various ideas that we might uh, commercialize throughout the game. All right, now the barriers in the first world to making the progress that we're looking to make is cynicism, which is uh, falls under, you can see there's, there's two different kind of categories in each section. You have a thinker category and a maker category. So over here, philosophy, over here, entrepreneurship. So one of the barriers in philosophy is cynicism. The barrier in entrepreneurship is dark money. And then you can see fiduciary media is a barrier uh, both f under philosophy and entrepreneurship. Again, as we go through, you'll see when the, the thinker side here and the maker side becomes important, but the thinker side, generally speaking, is going to be used for researching, the maker side for uh, commercializing. And then anytime you see these boxes, that's not a barrier. These are utilities. So we have Western universities here under philosophy, defense contractors under entrepreneurship, and then at the very bottom, everything leads to unemployment eventually, and then you have to rehire your workers. In the developing world, the problems that we've got across the top here are famine, hate groups, global warming, pollution, uh, actually have pollution twice, and then disease, social immobility, and slums, all right? We have freedom under the thinker side and productivity here under the maker side. For barriers under the freedom side, we have fatalism and protectionism. And then corruption and piracy are under the productivity side. And then under both, I'm sorry, yeah, and, and then under both freedom and productivity, we have the barriers of women's health and education. And so, again, the idea with these barriers, barriers are these are things that actually get in the way of making the progress that we're looking to make. Um, and here we have a utility of India and urban uh, China, so urban China under productivity and India under freedom. And so with these utilities, these are uh, basically, if I, if I use those, because I'll be hiring workers onto the board, and most of these spots could only have one worker uh, in them, all right? And if I'm just dealing with the barrier itself, if I'm not if I don't have a company on there, which is represented by these discs, then the whatever I'm trying to do is going to be more expensive. It's And the way the game refers to it is it's not subsidized. If I had, so for instance, if I had a company here, if that was my company, my worker's there, and I use this worker to do some research, well, that is then subsidized and it's going to be less expensive. Well, when the board starts, you don't have any companies out there, obviously, but you can still hire your guys into utilities, and those will be subsidized automatically. Now, the downside is there are certain things, uh, certain benefits that you cannot gain by using utilities, and we'll talk about all that as we go through. Specifically, you can see here, you can't generate patents by using utilities. All right, now over here for cloud, we have three problems across the top. We have interface, artificial consciousness, and again, artificial consciousness. So that's these two right here are uh, duplicates of each other, just like over here we have pollution and aging over here. So we have security on the thinker side, privacy on the maker side. ID theft and adverse jurisdictions are barriers on the thinker side. Data hackers and bandwidth bottlenecks are the... Uh, barriers on the privacy side, and then Big Brother is a barrier for both of them. We have tech giants over here as utility for the security and cloud providers for privacy. And then finally, we have space. There's only two problems over there on space, earthbound 
and the exoscience gap. For the thinker side, we have astronautics, the maker side, robotics, and then you can see we have a bunch of barriers because uh, obviously space is something we're the, probably the farthest from getting to. So uh, we have radiation, human atrophy, and uh, space debris for astronautics prob or barriers. And then we've got energy density and heat rejection for robotics barriers. And then for both the astronautics and robotics, we have miniaturization and rocket EQN, whatever that is, as barriers for both of them. And then, of course, utilities for astronautics, you have the International Space Station and robotics, we have NASA. All right, so currently the, the regime in the world is globalization, and that is because we don't have a dominant sphere. None of these four spheres are dominant right now. And dominance is determined by the bottom three cards in the human progress play. So right now there's only one card there, and so we have globalization as the dominant sphere, which means that currently all work in the developing world is subsidized, which means I don't really need to be using the utilities right now because I can use any of those and it will and the, the work will still be subsidized, whether it's a thinker work or a maker work, it'll be subsidized and therefore will be cheaper than it would otherwise be. Um, but let's say that, for instance, over here, let's say that uh, another yellow uh, idea got commercialized over there. So let's say Spy Dust got commercialized. And when it did, I put the card like that so that the uh, yellow portion was sticking out. Well, now, where is it? Here it is. So now we have two cards in the cutting edge are trans biology. And so we now have the dominant sphere being the first world, and that means that surge arrow icons of both colors exist on each idea. We'll get to surge arrows as we start playing, but that's actually a really good thing. For, well, it's a good thing for everybody. So it could be really helpful to me, but it could also be really helpful to the AI. And also trans biology patents are worth double. So right now, the only patent I have is this one patent for um, assembly. And it's not worth anything because there are no assembly ideas in the display. But as we go along, it probably will be. And let me show, show you why. Now, I promise that I riffle shuffled my deck. I always riffle shuffle. I mixed up real good. And I still came out with all of this orange down here, which is frankly very, very amazing. Now, unfortunately, I then, when I, when I, drew my cards to figure out what my hidden sphere of, uh, was that I was going to focus on, I couldn't get any orange. And I ended up with green as my hidden sphere. And what that means is that I want to, if the game were to end in a uh, with a tipping point, uh, with, so for instance with the green tipping point, which is somewhere in the bottom half of that deck over there, I'd get more points for having green companies and stuff like that. Green companies and green problems. And in fact, I can just show you this here. So game end, tipping point. A tipping point card is commercialized, and then if, you know, if the regime was green, then one victory point problem, one victory point per problem and company in my hidden sphere, and then two victory points uh, per problem and company in the dominant sphere. So, I got a good shot with all this orange out here of pretty easily making the dominant sphere space, which means I might want to start focusing on building companies in space as the game goes along. But I also am going to get victory points, assuming a tipping point is how the game ends, by having uh, companies in my hidden sphere, which is the developing world. But the game could end in other ways as well. Singularity, for instance, if five or more adjacent disciplines of the same color are in the display. So we could get a singularity pretty easily over here too by having five oranges uh, over here, five assembly ideas. And in that case, the only victory points issued out are going to be one victory point per future shock agent in the display. Future shock, again, is if I have any of my workers here, my cubes, on, for instance... Pebble Fission has two white heat right here. And so if I put my two uh, workers there and then that goes into the display. And so now they are two future shock 
right there. And so they'd be worth one virtue point each if orange were the, uh, or actually this doesn't even say that it has to be that color. So really it's just per future shock agent. So all of the ones over here that are future shock would give victory points. Uh, plurality, I can almost guarantee that's not going to happen. That's if we go all the way through that deck. There's a card at the bottom called plurality. And then if you know certain things happen, if it's researched, then the game ends and you get one victory point per problem in your hidden sphere plus one victory point per problem in the dominant sphere. But now here's what I think is probably going to happen because so far every time I've played solo, this is how the game has ended. Tycoon, establish a fifth company. Uh, basically, whichever one of us establishes a fifth company instantly wins. I've seen the solo game end that way every single time, so I'm pretty certain that's what we're going to see happen here. Uh, and again, the companies are these discs, and so if I can get four of them out, because I only have four, and then after the fourth one, I put one more out, and the game immediately ends, and I win. There's no victory points at all, it's just I win. So that's what we'll be aiming for with the idea also being, well, maybe I should kind of focus on the developing world a little bit too because it is my hidden sphere. And that way, if somehow the AI manages to hold me off, it manages to trigger the end of the game in a different manner, then I'll still be able to uh, get some victory points. So real quick, down here in the market, we have... Uh, these numbers right here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's the cost of uh, um, syndicating these ideas. And when you syndicate an idea, you take one of your cubes, you put it out there, and that's going to then mean, okay, now I'm, you know, let's say, so this one right here actually has an ability. Orange, orange is viable for me. So let's say I, I didn't already have orange, orange viable. If I have a cube on there, it is now viable for me. Uh, and I'm ready to go. I'll be able to use orange. I'll be able to commercialize orange, orange without actually having it viable. But to put this cube there in the first place, that's called syndicating. I would need to pay three money to do that. So I am playing the game on the highest difficulty level that is uh, acknowledged in the rule book, which basically involves me having these. I have two AI opponents. And you can see they do have hidden spheres of their own. I don't know what they are. Again, that's only if we don't end with Tycoon. If we end with a different, a different uh, set of in-game circumstances, then those tip, those um, not tipping points, uh, hidden spheres will come into play that way. And so, having two opponents is more difficult than having three. Uh, and then this deck right here which is called the Exo Global Deck, which is what's going to determine what they do, is face down so I can't see what's coming, and that is considered more difficult as well. So the difficulty levels described in the rule book are you start off at three opponents with this deck face up. I then added a couple of difficulty levels in between that and the, most, and the hardest one uh, by playing with three AI opponents but with this deck face down. Then I did two AI opponents with the deck face up, and now I'm at two AI opponents with the deck face down, which, as I said, is what the rule book says is the most difficult way to play uh, solo play. However, I would imagine you could actually play against just one AI opponent, which I do think probably would be pretty difficult because they would really be uh, cranking out what they're doing pretty quickly. Play against one AI opponent with a deck face up and then with a deck face down. I don't know if I'm going to do that. We'll see how this goes. Honestly, I have the, so far Pax Transhumanity, as long as I'm playing everything right uh, or mostly right, has not been nearly as difficult as Pax Emancipation. But they're very different games. They have a couple of similar, the, the way these boards work are very similar. And the idea of the splay up here uh, is similar to Pax Emancipation's two splays and the idea of these markets. So that stuff's very similar, but as you can see, there's no world map. Uh, we're dealing with these spheres of, of, of thought, basically. And so it plays very differently. And to, to think just because there's a couple of different ideas here that are very similar, it'd be a mistake to think that this is basically reskinned Pax Emancipation. It's definitely not that. 
All right, so there you go. That's the setup for PAX Transhumanity. Be sure to come back and check out our gameplay of it. Uh, I've really been enjoying this game, so this should be fun. We'll see if I can beat the uh, hardest difficulty level and uh, see if it's worth me maybe trying to go beyond what the game recommends as the hardest difficulty level uh, later on after this. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, like I said, uh, you can find me over on Twitter, at Board Offline. And until next time, if you're bored online, board offline. Oh,